Sharing already, by the way. Yeah. Checking if uh, Jacob's still awake. Are you here, Jacob? Yeah, I'm here. All right. Did you see the previous one? Uh, I saw the end of it. Did you, did you hear your voice? <laughs> the recorded video was posted. Anyway, we're about to start. Is he coming or no? Uh, he's online. Oh, he's online? Okay. I grabbed it anyway just because we didn't. Hey, Tony. Good. 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 Uh, I saw you online a minute ago. Yeah, we have back here. Oh, okay. All right. Stuff. You guys all set up here? Yeah, I think we're good. Um, is that Jonathan, the son that you were talking to? Or, uh, uh, Jonathan Monroney? Was that? Well, John was uh, was in the previous no, no. the last one. Oh, okay, he's hung up. All right. Jacob Godel, senior software engineering student, is going to present the course of this. He's going to put on. Oh, okay. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he had a. He sounded a lot like John. Oh, really? I thought, I thought for sure. John was there like ten minutes ago. Yeah, I know. But I didn't want to. I didn't want to. Right. Yeah. Hey, hey. <laughs> how are you doing? Yeah. So that's that's part of what the conference is about. Yeah. Ready to go, huh? Good afternoon. My name is Angela, and I'm a member of the Hatch Twins team. 
Um, I'll be monitoring today's session. And just so you're all aware, today's session will be recorded for future use. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Mohammed Abushak, Rusty Leonard, Jacob Fultel, and Evan Wilson presenting and we're off establishing the autonomous vehicle program after. Okay. Well, I'll start out because I got a, the first couple of slides here. Um, this was a collaboration with, let's see if this works. Oh. There we go. All right. So <laughs> we hatched this idea over coffee. And uh, it was kind of funny because I had this idea. And then, uh, you know, I was uh, told to seek out Muhammad there and, uh, you know, have a chat with him. So we met at a Starbucks in Grand Rapids and laid it all out. And we uh, brainstormed it, and this is what happened. So basically, um, this is a three-legged stool that we got going on here. And uh, our first leg here is this autonomous vehicle certificate, which is done. It's implementing in the fall of, of 2022. And uh, then our, our next leg will be a, a cybersecurity certificate to go along with this you know, vehicular communication and that sort of thing. And so that's in progress. Um, and then another leg here, the third one, is the electric and hybrid vehicle certificate that we're also in, in progress with um, there. So once we put them all together, so these are three certificates, right? We put them all together and um, they stack themselves into a, nicely into a, a master's degree in advanced vehicular technology. And so, um, again, you know, that is uh, all the pieces of the puzzle that you're going to we're going to really focus in on on the piece number one, and so I'll, I'll let Muhammad take over from here. Thank you. And, uh, I still remember that meeting. <laughs> Tons of work after that. But we, we did it. <laughs> so uh, autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, we all hear about them. They're very relevant. They're very significant. There's some numbers to show us where we are. So the expectations, the predictions are 15% of car sales by 2030. That's what is it, eight years from now, will be fully autonomous, will be autonomous at the, at the major level. 33 million AVs on the road by 2040, that's the expectation. Uh, there is right now 1,500 uh, self-driving cars in the US between companies that are implementing. For example, Google Waymo has a car on the road for five years now. And the five years, no accidents, except a very, very minor bump with a, with a van, I should say. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> Uh, 3 billion in funding for self-driving technology in 2021, that's 3 billion in one year. Uh, AV is being tested by 80 companies. There will be consolidations. There will be, these companies will kind of maybe go down a little bit as the scene is being clear from a business perspective, but there's a huge interest. 54 billion global AV market size, the expectation, the size of these companies that are working on this, uh, for example, General Motors, very relevant to us in Michigan, uh, the cruise raised two $2 billion over the last two years. Now, in terms of the interest from people, the latest survey says 57% of people willing to ride inside an AV today. They're okay with that. 55% of small businesses say they would love to have a fully AV fleet or autonomous fleet in the next 20 years. They would love that fact for multiple Reasons. So the adoption by the population is, is, is really high. There's high interest in this topic. So from our perspective at Terra, we want to teach this topic. It's highly interesting. We want to start a degree in this field. What do we need to teach? The challenge with teaching autonomous vehicles, it's a holistic product. It's like saying, I'm going to teach the computer, everything about the computer. Well, with an AV, you have a mechanical engineer that built the car. You have an electrical engineer for the sensors. You have a software engineer, you have multiple aspects. So what, are, what is it that we need, we need to teach to cover autonomy? So these are some of the uh, topics we need to cover. From a machine learning perspective, that's the major topic, that's the new thing, that's the brain of the car. And you need to teach the car to uh, use predictive machine learning to detect objects, to see the road, to plan the path, to do multiple other, uh, other things like Maybe uh, if there's an obstacle on the road to avoid it, maybe uh, to, if there's a, a problem with traffic, to predict traffic and actually 
plan uh, the road. Uh, we have a localization problem, which is basically the car knowing where exactly it is. So that's a hardware problem. And there are multiple technologies. So the best the GPS can do is not good enough for the accuracy of driving. So you have to use a technology like radar, LIDAR, and the newest thing, image recognition, just by using image recognition. We have path planning, of course. We talked about that. You want to predict traffic. You want to plan the trip. You want to maneuver. All of that is a challenge. And you have control altogether, connecting those commands to uh, the you know, steering, to control the actual car, the mechanical aspect of things. So all of this, if we can include them in a degree, that will be wonderful. And that's what we try to do. Some areas need strong background in electrical engineering or mechanical engineering. So we focus this specific certificate on the software side of things, the brain of the car, how does it think? We have received funding for this project and we have built tools to support the learning for students. We wanna make it easy for students to actually adopt and, and pick up that, those concepts. So what we did is we, built, uh, we offered a four dimensional learning experience. First, we built a few tools that are in-house, like we built them, some of our software engineering students built those tools to help with back planning, recognizing images, small concepts that are easier taught using a software tool than just, okay, let's talk about them theoretically or mathematically. So we'll show some of those today. We also are going to use this guy here, DeepRacer. DeepRacer is uh, 1 over 16, if I'm not mistaken, or 18, 18 size uh, the autonomous car, fully autonomous car. Is it if it's super efficient? I would not. Uh, <laughs> promise you that, but from a learning perspective, is it really good? It's an amazing experience from a learning perspective. It has the sensors, it has the cameras, it moves sometimes, and uh, it does well. You can build a, a predictor model on it, and it, you know, it, it, it's really good for learning. Then, if a student, if someone, if I'm getting into that field and I want to get the set of skills that are needed in the industry to work in Ford or GM or anywhere, this is a really good start. And then we move on to a more challenging, kind of more realistic scenario. There is a simulator that is used by researchers called Carl. This is built on a game, game engine called uh, Unreal. And you can test all types of scenarios, traffic, different weather, and the car is there and you program it or you build the model in it to drive itself on itself. Much safer than actually testing on a real car, especially as you're learning. And finally, is uh, this guy here. It's a tool called Open Pilot, which is really just a phone that has the brain of the car and you connect it to your car and it becomes autonomous. If your car has features like adaptive lane control, so you, you know that the computer of the car can control the steering of the car, adaptive lane control that protects safety. If your car has adaptive cruise control, it means the computer of the car can control the speed, can stop the car, can push the car, etc. So. This tool, this device kind of connects to those features and controls them. And if the brain of the car is, which is loaded on here, is smart enough, it can be an autonomous vehicle. So that's a summary of our approach for teaching autonomous vehicle for this master certificate or graduate certificate. We built it as a four core certificate. The first one is machine learning foundations, just basics of how do you build a model to predict things. In addition, within this course, we'll do some programming. If someone comes in with not, without huge experience in programming, that gives us a chance to do that. Then we have autonomous vehicle engineering, autonomous vehicle programming, and finally, the capstone using open pilot. So we want our, you know, our goal today is to demo some of the tools we built as part of this project. I just want to say first that these tools were fully built by software engineering students here at Ferris. All of them have quality work, uh, industry level. So this is something as a student here at Ferris, as an undergrad, as a grad, it's something totally manageable for you to build the tools, let alone use the tools and learn from the tools. So I'm very proud to work with this team. Evan Wilson is here. Jacob Grotel is connected online. I have been uh, very proud to work with them on this project. So we'll start tool by tool from the smallest to the largest. And uh, you know, if you, if you stay with us till the end, we have a video of Deep Racer, two cars racing with each other. So, thank you. Uh, Jacob, all yours. We'll start with the path planning. Yep, let me share real quick. 
So as Jacob is sharing, the tool here is teaching us how uh, the car plans the path. So think of it as the Google Maps feature. That's the same, almost the same algorithm that is used there. Google has the map, has all the points and distances and traffic and the cost, and it plans what is the fastest route to go from here to here. So we'll see um, uh, the tool that uh, Jake can show us for it. So just one second, because you're on the second screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all right, Jacob, you're on. Cool. So this is the tool that we made for trying out path planning algorithms. So I'm gonna load up. Just a preset one right now. Um, let's do Michigan. So essentially what this tool allows you to do is create a series of nodes and connect them. And it'll try to find a path um, along these routes, call them roads, whatever. And um, yeah, let's say we want to go from, let's say Marquette to Grand Rapids. We'll say, what is the fastest path? Um, and what the program will do is kind of step, walk you through step by step um, through how the planning algorithm works. Um, so essentially what it's doing is it gets the distance between two points um, and it tries to find the shortest path um, from, let's see, so you start at that node, obviously there's only one that it can go to, so it goes to that one. Um, and then it will go and check all of the new nodes that that connects up to. And it will first check the shortest one, because that one's guaranteed to be the shortest path to that. So it'd be from Marquette to Traverse City. So we'll check that, only goes to one. And it'll kind of walk through and find the fastest way to get to a city from the previous ones it knows about. You can see it walk through. And once it gets to Grand Rapids, it decides, yep, that's the shortest path then. Um, and you have that. Like I said, now let's make it not accurate. You can move these nodes around. So say, Macon Island's actually down there. Move these all over the place. We can throw in a new one, so put it up here, and then connect up the path to it. Let's give it a name. Say Ferris makes its own city. And then we can say, let's go from, we'll say Kalamazoo to that new one. And you can try out different algorithms as well. So A star is another path planning algorithm that you can use um, that works pretty similar. So we can step through and just again see what it's thinking. And eventually here, it found the shortest path. Yeah, so that is the path planning tool. So the, the, again, the goal behind this is students would study those algorithms like Kestra and ASTAR from a mathematical perspective, what is supposed to be the shortest path. And now they can experiment with it with a real map, maybe Michigan map or any map that they'd like and build that path. And then they would see the results of the algorithm much better than just explaining it mathematically or on a board or any of that, especially that our audience will be uh, students who are coming from the industry maybe, or students who are not in software or different background. So anything visual would help. Awesome. Thank you, Jake. And then the next uh, step, we're, we're still with, the, with Jake. The next step is the next tool, which is a traffic sign recognition. So one major, major ability that the car needs to do is to read traffic signs and to detect objects in general. 
So we need to, to learn as a, as a master's student or as a graduate student that one is, wants to build an EV, we need to learn how the car thinks and recognizes and that visual aspect of traffic signs or detecting any object. So to, to show that, we have built a you know, model to detect traffic signs. So I'll let you present it. Yeah, so this is um, tool we made for another research project, but part of that, um, we uploaded the traffic sign classification. So we can upload an image, um, let's say just a stop sign. And as you can imagine for an autonomous vehicle, recognizing traffic signs is fairly important. So one way you can do that is through machine learning. So we'll upload that stop sign um, and it'll give us a result. So it predicted that it's a stop sign. Um, and then we also, from machine learning algorithms like this, we get a confidence, um, which is, as it says, a confidence, how confident it is in its prediction. So in this case, it was 99.5% confident. So it's pretty sure that that picture is a stop sign. Another note I should say is that the data for this was trained um, on German stop signs. Um, that was just the most readily available and best data set that we could use for training. So in this case, we can upload a 30 kilometer sign, kilometers per hour, and hit predict. You can see that it predicted correctly um, and is even more confident at 99.98%. We can also give it something that it won't know what it is. So say this picture of a cat, um, obviously no traffic signs with this on it. So we'll just see what it does. Um, and it says right away at next intersection and way less confident at 45%. So it's basically like, I don't know what's in this potentially. So I'm just gonna, if I had to guess, I'd say right away. But. Yeah. So, so this uses the exact, you know, very similar algorithm to what the car uses to predict traffic. When we say a machine learning algorithm here, this is different than classic programming. This is not explicitly programmed to go, if it's a red sign and there's the letter S, that means it's a stop sign. It doesn't work that way. It basically works depending on viewing, like we've seen here, German traffic signs, thousands and thousands. And each one of them is what we call labels. What does that mean? It means there's an image and there's a label to the image that says maybe, oh, this is a, a stop, this is a yield, this is a, a 30 kilometer speed. Now, what the system does is it, it sees all those thousands and tries on itself to find patterns and recognize patterns and say, oh, it looks like the images, when they look that way, then that's the label it does. So that's how machine learning works. And it's, it's really uh, very relevant for the traffic science prediction for this. Thank you, Jay. So we move on to the next step, which is Deep Racer. So Deep Racer, as we said, it's, uh, we've seen that, it's a 118 uh, car. And uh, Deep Racer was you know, produced by Amazon for mostly for, for learning, for educational purposes, for students to kind of experiment with machine learning, to experiment with, uh, autonomous vehicles. So the way they offer it is they have a console that is available on the cloud that you as a student or as a learner or as an educator have access to, and you can train your car, your deep racer car without actually testing on the real car yet, and train it on the cloud and use it and see the effect of it on multiple different tracks. So you can train it on a certain track and then see how it performs on that track. There are multiple parameters you can control. Uh, DeepRacer uses a, a type of algorithm under machine learning called reinforcement learning. So you can think of this as, you know, training a puppy. So what happens is basically it goes, you give it a reward. You tell it, all right, if you stay on the center of the lane, uh, you'll get a high reward, you will win. So what, what the car tries to do is try different random movements. Oh, what, what if I turn right here? What if I turn left here? What if I keep going straight forever and ever? And then... It just measures what reward it's getting every time. And by thousands and, and thousands of trials, it's learning what actions are actually rewarding and what actions are not rewarding. So that's how reinforcement learning works, exactly like training 
a puppy, but the puppy is a bit faster than the puppy. So uh, we'll, we'll see how the console works. Uh, there's, there's a really nice official tool there. We'll let Evan uh, demo the console for us, and then we'll see. All right, so here's the console for oh, when it's you. Not, it's not showing you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Kind of nice to drag it to the browser. Yeah. All right. Like that. Okay. Okay. The problem is I can't quite see it. You snap it in the package. All right, so this is the Deep Racer console. Uh, the first thing you would do is put in the name and any description for the model that you're going to create. A lot of times I'll fill in like speed data or. Uh, then you can choose the track, and as Mohammed was saying, you have multiple tracks to choose from. Um, it's important to kind of change the track because you want it to explore different environments. You don't want to train on the same thing over and over again, because then it'll just learn how to quickly execute that one track. It's not actually going to learn how to uh, navigate you know, barriers. I've already chosen one down here. Uh, different types of ways you can train it. So you can train it on a time trial, or you can train it, train it to avoid objects, or you can train it to avoid other vehicles on the road. Uh, what's important here are the hyperparameters. So um, here's where you will define certain things about the machine learning algorithm itself. So for example, the important one here is entropy, uh, and that's the amount of randomness that it's going to use to uh, try to discover new action. So a, a higher entropy will be uh, more random. It's not necessarily something you want. And here you can define action space. Uh, you have two choices, continuous and discrete. And what this is, is the values of the steering and the speed in which uh, the car is going to use to explore the track. Uh, and then you can change it again from discrete to continuous. So you can go through these values continuously or discreetly per. Um, so if you want to go like three miles per hour at negative 25 steering angle, you can set that in that discrete. And to add to that, if we think of the action space, this is a car that is making a decision at every single small time period. So it's deciding what speed it goes for, what steering, if it breaks, if it stops. So all of that is open within that reinforcement learning model for the car to kind of experiment with. What Kevin mentioned in terms of the entropy, it does have to try random actions every now and then. Why? Because otherwise I'm going on a straight line and it's, it's rewarding. I'm on, I'm on the center of the road, no problem. But then suddenly I'll get out of the road because it's turning. So if I don't try random actions to see what works, what doesn't work, it's not going to work efficiently. Going to leave the, uh, track, uh, you can see this is the discrete action space. So you'll have a specific speed for a specific steering angle uh, rather than exploring values in between. You can just pick the discrete. So we're either giving it one of these nine options or we're telling it, hey, anything that you want to choose within the Uh, you can pick the car that you want. <laughs> uh, this is also a very important part. So as Mohammed was talking about the reinforcement learning, um, this is where we define how we reward the machine learning model. Um, so like he was using the puppy example, um, you can see here we, the purpose of this script is to keep the track close to the center line. So we're going to reward, um, 
We're going to reward higher if it stays closer to the line, and we're going to start ignoring it as it starts to stray away. So we don't give it a negative reward. You can see here you have one e to the negative three. That's uh, what point zero zero one. So um, we're not giving it a negative reward. We're just basically giving it nothing. So we're, we're, we're telling us if you're on the center of the track, that means you're on the track, you're still in, you're getting a lot of money, a lot of reward. And then we're, we're kind of controlling that a little bit. If you're further from the center by a certain space, I'm deducting that reward. And if you're out of the track, you're getting nothing. So that's where the system goes, oh, so what I did just now was not good because I didn't get a reward. Let me try something else. Let's try, start learning after that. Yeah, and we have uh, multiple options from the reward script itself. So we can, you know, for example, I could just type in to add the max speed or the speed that the vehicle is moving to whatever reward if I wanted to give it something extra. Um, so you can see here there's a number of um, functions already given for you. I typically stick with the center line, but we also have one to present uh, to prevent zigzag, to stay within the two borders. And object avoid for head to head rate. Okay, so I'm not going to create a new model. I've already got one going. This one's been training for about 35 minutes, so I actually started it while we were sitting back there. And you can kind of see it's not really doing great. <laughs> Experimenting on the left a little bit, right a little bit, then, then it leaves, once it leaves the track, kind of around the around. You can see I use the center line reward function. So it, it is trying to stay close to the center reward. It's starting to take these corners a little bit. And then anytime it goes outside the border, it, it stops. So we're And this one has been training for an hour and 41 minutes. Um, so a little bit more than an hour, more than the previous one. And it should be doing better. Maybe not. It's learning. Yeah. Usually at two hours, it starts to be pretty good. I notice how the tool is really kind of nice and educational in a way you're seeing a reward graph or all types of detail where the detailed analytical tool if you want to really get into uh, that from an educational perspective so they built it with a uh, you know with with leagues in mind with expansions in mind there's already races uh, like global races for education so it's kind of fun and education and that's it besides the video thank you very much if you like it. So, so what happens is just after what I mentioned. So you train it here, and then when it's when I'm kind of confident about it, I'm ready to use it. I can kind of move on and load that model to that actual car here. So that's that's what we did. <laughs> is everybody ready? <laughs> right. So we do have a an experiment with one car. That's what this is what it's This is one example of again one of our models running. This is better than other models. And there's always three dots, right? So you, you kind of control the speed, also you want it to turn right. So this is all uh, 
learning. The, the, the trade off from a programming perspective is that I don't need to tell it anything, it learns on its own. But that's much easier to program and that's the benefit from uh, machine learning. That's a nice and efficient model right there. Once it gets to that level, I'm ready to kind of test on it. So to test on uh, on the on the real um, car, what we need is a track. So we have purchased roofing material. And uh, Jacob uh, generously allowed us to, you know, set it up in the in the garage, and we kind of started training, as you can see here. Ideally, you would want it to, um, you know, perform exactly as in the console, but obviously at the beginning, it's kind of more difficult for the car to actually recognize what's in there. You can see the concrete is kind of similar color also to the deep eraser. So we have a theory that that might uh, cause it to take more time to train, but you know, it's going on. Notice all of that is from the shoot, from the camera on the side, this is the car's camera, how it sees things. And yeah, that is deep eraser. So what we want to do also is to find an experiment where to race between two deep racing. So that is what we're going to do. So that's our, you know, our engineering efforts. Jacob's there, Kevin's there. The picture is a little bit dark. This is the picture before the race, the red car, the blue car. And this is when the race started. And if you're ready, you can start showing the videos. We have, uh, I'm going to show two races today. First one part was kind of experimenting. Wait for it to load for a second. Okay. And one, two, and three. The red, the red, the red one and the blue one. All right, all right, all right, all right. A surge of speed. Cutting corners a little bit. Train more. It does need a bit more training, maybe, but it did well. Let's see how the race. Hopefully, more time as well. Before we start, Jacob, are we sharing the video? Uh, now we can see it, but the last one it was sharing the other screen. Okay. Sorry about that. Thanks for the note. Now we start again. Blue car versus red car. Let's go.
is a bit more same. You can see that the red card side of the strategy. So what have we got here then, Mike? Tell me, tell me. Uh, well, we have a strange graph drawn out on my page. A comment on a previous video asked about Dykes' shortest path. Now, I happen to have implemented Dykes' shortest path for one of the pieces of research I was doing a few years ago. So I thought I'm at least somewhat placed up to give an opinion on it. There was a little model both in the simulation where finishing the track 100% of the time. So when we evaluated them, they always completed the track. And you put them in their live track and they start crashing into the garage door. We call that sim to real. There's always a gap between the simulation uh, entering the real world. Yeah. We started the future of really sharing. Yep, we can see it. And now we start again. Blue car versus red car. Let's go. Is trying to cut corners. <laughs> that car is going nice and slow. Slow and steady. And. Well, that's, uh, uh, you know, so the races that we've uh, we worked through. I'm going to uh, just show everyone uh, the next tool. But before that, just a, just a word on Deep Racer. Deep Racer is a device that has a camera, has two battery, that has electricity connection, has sensors. There's multiple levels of skills that students will learn and experiment with. And it's not, as you can see, it's not a, an exact science. We're experimenting with multiple things, training on the console, as Evan said, it's perfect. But here, now we put it on a garage, just like a real car, there are different factors, right? We're the blue car and the red car are trained to the same parameters. Different, different parameters. It's a race, so we gotta <laughs> keep it confidential. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So they're they're trained with different models. So uh, that was that was the pre Finally, uh, on Open Pilot, the tool that we have here, this is this is our our, our next project or our next step really is to program. This is a tool that has. Uh, ready autonomy features for multiple um, um, different cars for multiple models. We're going to implement that for a newer a model, and we're going to show that and uh, you know basically demonstrate the abilities to run as an autonomous vehicle level two, which is basically driving the car uh, on its own uh, without the interference of uh, a human being. So that's Open Pilot. I'm going to show you. This is how it looks, and then we will, we will wrap up. So this is what open pilot is supposed to uh, be on the on the real road. So basically, it's connected on the windshield of the car. It's connected to your car's computer. It hooks up to the adaptive cruise control, adaptive lane control, and the sensors of the car. And it has also its own camera. And then it drives the car once you start. So there are multiple models that it's available for. And what we're going to do is we're going to experiment with one model and run it. And hopefully, uh, our plan is in April to demo it at the university level and send the videos to all the So uh, in terms of the next steps uh, for the program, uh, so the program starting in, in fall, we've started developing a web page for, uh, for the program as well. And it's not you know, out there yet, um, but let me show you. And this is the the program. There are all the details, press info, uh, requirements, faculty, courses, and all of that. So, uh, it's it's not out there yet, but it's a start. So anybody who's 
you know, was interested in autonomous vehicles, please let them know, connect them to us, and we'll be happy to help them gain those sets of uh, skills. Awesome. As I promised, I wanted to, uh, you know, wrap up the presentation early to give time for questions. So, any questions? Any comments? I guess I have a question. So, um, when it comes to like real world implementation, um, how do you see coming over obstacles like snow or, or debris in these different climates that aren't like perfect weather conditions? That's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. So, image recognition has gone leaps and bounds for five or 10 years. Image recognition is being so traditionally to recognize objects. Radar was the main thing, now LIDAR. But image recognition has developed so much that it, it's now a competitor for those things. So basically the car is seeing the road instead of using radar, which is pretty accurate, just images. So this is used at, you know, already used at the military level for tanks and all that type of stuff. And now it's going to be used heavily for, for cars. So it's, it's becoming pretty efficient. But, you know, they're experimenting. <laughs> There's some other sensors in there as well. Like I know the Teslas have like a traction center sensor of some kind. Um, it's a lot better than a human. So if you're driving a Tesla and you start to slip, it'll correct itself without the person even knowing. Um, so I'd imagine um, you could probably just hard code that in. Right. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions about the program, about the technology? When will the like website for the program developed? Should be, you know, they're waiting for my feedback. So okay. <laughs> well, there's, there's another piece of it too. It, it's got to go through um, HLC approvals. So there's two more approvals that you're waiting on. And one of them is um, it goes to all the uh, officers of the 15 universities in Michigan, and they got to give their blessing to it. And then it goes to uh, Higher Learning Commission, and they got to give their blessing to it. And then this site can go live but until then we can't advertise yep. um that's just the rules of the game yep. no i yeah we just went through all that so yeah, yeah. oh you're on the um yeah it's okay so you know this yeah yeah thanks completely any questions from the online audience all right excellent thank you very much for listening uh it's great to be here we want to thank the Hatch Committee and everybody who helped organize this, and uh, we'll see you all in future presentations.